previously on The Sojo Files. This is Chad Atwell, and I'm proud to have been one of the lawyers that defended Jordan Shreve. This is Chris Carlisle, and I'm proud to have worked with Chad Atwell defending Jordan Shreve. And I thought, you know, it could have been her, it could have been Jordan. I think it reads more like it was her, but uh, it doesn't necessarily exonerate him. And then you watch the interviews, and you're like, no, it was, it was absolutely Eva. Uh, there's no chance Jordan did. It was 100% Eva. I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that Jordan didn't have a story of the day of what happened to Olivia because he wasn't there. The genesis for everything that unfolded came from Eva Mel. Looking back on it, we know that she's lying about certain things for a fact. She's saying things that are not true. And Jordan's just saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And they're taking Eva at her word when they really should not be doing that. I wouldn't even call what happened in the interview room at the Vanier Police Department with Eva Millard on that day. I wouldn't call it a custodial interrogation, or I wouldn't call it an interrogation. I wouldn't call it a forensic interview. I wouldn't call it a search for truth. I wouldn't call it fact-finding. I would call it, uh, I would call it a, a charade. Last week on The Sojo Files, Chad Atwell, Chris Carwile, and myself did an episode comparing and contrasting the interrogations of Jordan Shreve and Eva Millard. We are about to start covering evidence next week. But before we do that, I wanted to add an additional episode going over all of the different versions of events that Eva Millard told for the morning of November 8th, 2018. The reason I wanted to add this additional episode is because even though you guys have already listened to the interrogation tapes, they are a huge chunk of time and there's a lot going on and I think it will help everyone better understand just how many versions of the story she told if I put them all together for one episode and that will help you all better understand all of the different versions she told because those are of crucial importance throughout the entirety of this case, and they will also be of importance when we start covering evidence next week. So let's get into it. Eva's version of events start when Jordan arrives at the house, and she allegedly finds Olivia in the pack and play. At that point, she picks her up, she's frantic, she's screaming, Jordan calls 911. Her version of events changes within minutes by the time that officers and first responders arrive on the scene. Officer Wooten was the second person to arrive on the scene that day. He spoke with Eva Millard inside of the home, and according to his incident report for that day, Eva Millard told him, and I quote from his report, She just woke up moments before the call to 911 and found her daughter in the floor. She stated that she thought she must have crawled out of the playpen where she sleeps and hit her head. She reiterated several times that the child had a history of climbing out of the playpen. Now, we know from the dispatch records that Jordan's first call to 911 went in around 12.15 in the afternoon and his second one followed within minutes. The crime scene log for that day has Officer DeCru, who was the first officer to arrive on scene that day, arriving at 12.20 in the afternoon. Now, there are some issues with the crime scene log, but we will get into that on a later episode. The point is, within a five-minute span or within a span of mere minutes, Eva Millard had already changed her story from finding Olivia in the pack-and-play to finding her in the floor. While Eva is talking to Officer Wooten inside of the residence, Officer DeCru asks that Eva Millard be escorted outside of the residence, and at that point, Eva is placed into the back of Officer DeCru's cop car, which is parked outside of 2210 Granite Circle. That is reflected in Officer Wooten's incident report when he writes, DeCru advised me that we needed to take her outside. I then began helping him to escort her out to Corporal DeCruz's patrol car. 
Millard tried pulling away and had to be nearly restrained, but we secured her in the back of Corporal DeCruz's car until CID could come to the scene. I asked Millard for the information on her new husband who had apparently left the scene just as the 911 call went out. Presumably, Eva Millard is the one that provided that information to Officer Wooten because I cannot think of another logical reason for how he would have obtained that information at this point in time, other than, of course, from Eva Millard. What I do know is that according to Wooten's report, he asked Eva for that information after... Him and DeCrew put Eva in the back of DeCrew's cop car. Now, maybe Wooten did ask her that question, or maybe he didn't. The issue is that that is only documented in Officer Wooten's incident report. That is not reflected or captured on Officer DeCrew's dash cam footage, or at least not the dash cam footage that was provided to the defense. In the defense's copy of DeCruz dash cam footage, it reflects Eva sitting in the back of DeCruz cop car for only a few minutes before she is approached by Officer Hernandez to sign the search consent form. And then she is approached by Detective Perry where she tells this version of events. Um, did that guy have the, what, what's the drive? The black um, Chevy Silverado. What's your model? Old one or old one? 2004 or something like that. Do you know where he's at right now? No, he said he was going to take a friend to Long John Silver's and come right back, but... What I time was that? Eight or nine this morning. So he told you that? Yeah, I was in bed still. I hadn't even seen her. I thought you were asleep. Was she in bed with you? <laughs> I was there. She was in a little... And the crew? It, it was a little playpen thing she sleeps in at the foot of my bed. Right. <laughs> she just tried to crawl out of it before and hurt herself except it was on her back. Right. But she was sick and tried to hit me. And she kept me up all night last time. And so I went to sleep with her this morning. Yeah. Does that make me horrible? <laughs> no. No. And what's going on, sir? Well, obviously you know, I mean, it's not good. What do you mean it's not good? I mean, I understand she's gone, but what's going on? Why am I in here? Well, because we're, we're trying to figure out what happened, okay? I'm telling you what happened. What? That she tried to crawl out. Did you see her? No. Then you don't have any idea that's what happened. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. No, but trust me, it's not. What do you mean? Well, it's not. That's I would. I'm saying that's probably not what happened. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. So Jordan woke you up about eight or nine and said he was going to Long John Silver. He's going to be right back. You just heard Eva tell Detective Perry that Jordan left the house around 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning to go meet a friend at Long John Silver's and that she had not seen him since he left. But then Detective Perry asked Eva who called 911 and she realizes she has to change her story. So who called 911? Both of us. You and who? Jordan. He so, came back for a few minutes. He had his friend with him. That's whenever I had seen Olivia. And he said he had to take uh, Billy home. And I said, wait a minute, I need help. I don't know what to do. And I was freaking out. And he said, well, I can't have him here whenever everybody shows up. Billy had I didn't know his last name. Jordan been selling drugs? He didn't know of. You're married to him. I said not that I know of. But why? you're married to him. You know he does drugs. Yeah, but what do you mean? Why? I'm just I'm just asking. Does he sell drugs? Not that I know of. Yes. Okay. So he left. And he hasn't come back. You have any idea where he would have went? Where's Billy live? 
don't know how to explain it to you, sir. Huh? I, I don't know. Have you ever been over to this house? Yeah, but I don't know how to get there. I just now moved here. Sir, I did not hurt my kid. Huh? I didn't do anything wrong to my baby. Okay. okay. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to get a statement from him when we get down to the police department. We'll take you down there and we're going to talk to you down there and get everything lined down, okay? But we're going to be some time here, okay? So until, just bear with us until we get everything figured out, okay? Eva, as you know, was then transported to the Van Buren, Arkansas Police Department for her interrogation, where her story changes throughout the entirety of that interrogation. Let's take a look at all the different versions of events that Eva told at the police department. What time did you get up this morning? You mean got up, got up? Mm -hmm. Right before I seen her. Jordan that came in. Now did you did you get up before Jordan well? We got up um, about four in the morning. Uh huh. And that was because Olivia was making noise or whatever, and I got up, and I picked her up, and I put her in bed with me. Okay. She was laying with me, and uh, of course I was tired, she was tired, he was tired, and she kept telling me no, no. And she telling you no? Yeah. And she didn't learn the words, she learned how to talk. I got you. Well, I got you. And we're tired. You what? We're tired. Right. And Tuna told me to put her back in the bed, in her bed where she sleeps. And of course, I got a little upset at him, and I was like, has she been sick? I should have put her back in. I should have just left her with me. Okay, so that was about four. For, it was so dark outside, so uh -huh. I know it was either middle of the night or morning. I didn't look at the time to turn. So you were you were asleep all night. You slept last night. You got up at four. We we didn't sleep a lot last night. Okay. Because of course she was up. Okay. She had went to sleep, so we went to sleep, mm -hmm. and then she started making noise, and I got up, okay. and I picked her up, and I put her in bed with me. Well, she was talking. No, just blah, 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 blah. She can't really talk. So I put her back down, and I gave her a bottle, and her little head was on her pillow. And then I climbed back in bed, and I went to sleep. And Jordan kind of nudged me and woke me up and told me he was going to go to Billy's. And I was like, okay. Did you get up and smoke a cigarette or anything? Like I, I did it in bed. I didn't get up out of bed. Okay. But she was what, but four, you put her back in her crib. Mm hmm Right. Okay. All right. Okay. What else? So then what happened? Okay. I went back to sleep. Then Jordan nudged me and told me he was leaving. And, uh... I think I smoked a cigarette in bed. I'm not for sure if I did or if I didn't, but I went back to sleep. And when he got home, again, I just had Billy in the trunk. Okay. That's when I seen him. She was in the crib? Yes. Not the crib, the playpen. Oh, yeah, right. Was. She was in the playpen. Yes. And so, and was she laying on her back, on her side? On her back. Okay. And I... What made you notice that something wasn't right? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Does she look abnormal? Does she look? She had her arm up like this, and her mouth was open, and she was on her bed. And I seen her, and it was kind of dark in the room, but she wasn't moving at all. And I touched her, and I yelled at Jordan because I, when I touched her, I knew something was wrong with her. And then he was trying to calm me down because I was freaking out. Okay. And I hadn't picked her up yet. But her little belly and stuff was warm. But her arm was stiff. So I started freaking out when I picked her up. <laughs> I had her right here. <laughs> she had stuff coming out of her mouth under my shirt. Well, then I put her on the couch. No, Jordan had taken her from me. 
I think I can really remember it. It was so crazy. And I told him I noticed this stuff on my shoulder, so I thought she might be choking. And I told her, I said, put her on her belly, put her on her belly on the couch. And he did, and this stuff started coming out of her mouth. <laughs> I said, where did the blood come from? Where is it coming from? Because I didn't know. Mm. She's tried to crawl out of that crib before. Well, that didn't, that stopped the cause of it because she was in the crib. Yeah, but she fell back into the crib because she couldn't get out of the crib. Yeah, but she that's not a saying? hard surface. That's not, that, that's, she could have fell out on the carpet and it wouldn't hurt her. That's not going to cause her to, to die. Absolutely not. But then I don't know what happened, sir. What's with all the bruises? Why does she have? Why is she bruised? I thought she fell on her face. I don't know. When I put her and to you're bed, you talking about in the, in the crib deal? Yes. When I put her to bed, none of that was on her. Okay. I swear to God, none of that was on her. <laughs> when so at four o'clock, did you put her back in her? Bed? I did. You did. Okay. And then I fell asleep. After that, I don't know what happened. Okay. The only thing I could think of is she fell. There are several key elements that I think are of note from Eva's initial story that she told once she was being interrogated. One key issue that Eva is continuously contradicting herself on is her time frame. For whatever reason, unbeknownst to us, Eva brings up 4 a.m. Eva tells the story of how Olivia woke them up, she was in the bed, and then Eva put her back in the pack and play at 4 a.m., and then Eva went back to sleep, and she really didn't wake up again until Jordan came home. But while she is so locked in on that 4 a.m. time frame and claiming to have been asleep the rest of the time, she also continuously says, well, we weren't sleeping very good. I was up all night. We were up all night. I was up all night. So which one is it? Were you awake at four and then asleep the rest of the time? Or were you up all night? One part of Eva's story that has already changed just from being in the back of the cop car to arriving at the police department is that you heard her while she was sitting in the back of Officer DeCruz's cop car tell Detective Perry that Jordan left around 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning and she had not seen him since. Until he asked who called 911 and then she's like, oh wait, yeah, he was here for a little bit. But once she gets to the police department, Jordan waking her up becomes a key part of her version of events. Something that bothers me from this round of storytelling with Eva Millard is that she mentions when she got up at 4 a.m. with Olivia that she gave Olivia a bottle and that the last time she saw her before she got back in bed, Olivia had her head on a pillow with her bottle that Eva had just allegedly given her. The thing is that there was no bottle found in the pack and play, but we know from crime scene photos that there was a full bottle of milk found next to the TV on the dresser. But unfortunately, that bottle of milk was not taken into evidence, and the only way we know that it even existed is from one crime scene photo. But they did not check to see if that was a new bottle of milk, an old bottle of milk, we know nothing about the bottle of milk except for there is one featured next to the TV in the crime scene photos. But there was no bottle found, according to anyone, in the pack and play. Eva is then asked whether or not she smoked a cigarette that morning. And initially, she is very confident, yes, I smoked a cig, but I smoked a cig in the bed. I didn't get out of the bed. I smoked the cigarette in the bed. But later on, she changed, as you heard, to being not so sure. So we went from being very confident that, yes, did smoke a cigarette, but in the bed, didn't get out of the bed, smoked the cigarette in the bed, did knock it out, to, uh, I can't really remember, I'm not sure if I smoked a cigarette or not. Something else that really sparked my attention was that she said Billy was in the truck when Jordan got home, and that's when she found Olivia. But how did she know that Billy hadn't come inside 
if she was asleep and woke up to Jordan waking her up inside the home. How would she have any idea that Billy had not come inside the home if she had been asleep at the time that Jordan walked in? The simple and most obvious answer, in my opinion, is that there's no way that she could know that if she had not been awake up until the point that Jordan woke her up. The way she claims to have found Olivia in this first round of storytelling is also something that I think is really important to make note of. She says that when she found Olivia, Olivia's mouth was open and that her arm was up over her head. She makes sure to give descriptive details like the fact that Olivia's belly felt warm, but that her arm was stiff. And I think that that was a very interesting description to give, saying that her arm was stiff, given that obviously, according to Eva's version of events, there was a lot of moving around, holding Olivia. And I know from crime scene photos that Olivia's arm was definitely not stuck above her head. And when she's mentioning the descriptive term stiff, she's obviously referencing whether intentionally or unintentionally rigor mortis, but it's very clear that Olivia was not to that level of rigor mortis yet where her arm would have been stuck in that position over her head. So I don't know why she referenced the word stiff or in what way she was trying to imply that her arm was stiff, but the only thing that I can think of is stiff in the sense of rigor mortis, and that was clearly not true. The last key points that I want to make sure to hit on before we move on is that she says when she picked up Olivia, stuff was coming out of her mouth onto her shirt, and that's when she had this light bulb go off in her head that Olivia must be choking, and she then put her on the couch, or maybe Jordan put her on the couch, or I can't remember who put her on the couch, but what led to her thinking that Olivia was choking was seeing stuff get on her shirt when she picked Olivia up. And then she continues to say that stuff was coming out of her mouth, blood was coming out of her mouth, but she's asking, where was the blood coming from? It's obviously coming from her mouth. You just fucking said that. Now let's continue, shall we? So when he came in, did y'all get in the argument, fight? Mm-hmm. You're talking about, I'm talking about when Billy and them were out in the car, out in the truck. Mm-hmm. I didn't get into an argument. No, I was freaking out that the baby was, I thought she was dead and he, he was, I was freaking out frantic. Uh-huh. And he was yelling at me saying, she's not dead, I feel a heart beating. I said, no, there's something wrong, call 911 now. So we called 911. If somebody thought that was an argument. Okay, I they just started yelling. We were freaking out. I was definitely freaking out, screaming at the top of my lungs. I didn't know what to do. And so, he, did he call 911? He called 911, then he left. I, I said, please yeah. stay, I can't go through this by myself. Please so he stay. immediately left? Yeah. Do you think that was normal? It's kind of odd, isn't it? Yeah, he said it was just because somebody was outside. But I did make him call 911. And then I didn't know if he called him or not because nobody showed up for a minute. And I was freaking out. I was walking back and forth to my room, to the baby, to my room, to the baby, because I didn't know what to do. So where was the baby at, on the couch? At first, I had her on the couch. Uh-huh. Then I had her on my bed. Because I walking back and forth, I didn't know what to do. I got you. I was just trying to hold my... My kid, I wanted her to be alive. I wanted her to come back. I didn't know what to do. Right. In this clip, you hear Eva say, not once, but twice, that she definitely knew that Jordan called 911. But then shortly after that, she changes it to say that she wasn't sure that Jordan had in fact called 911 because officers had not arrived quick enough and so she called. But we know that officers arrived on the scene within minutes of Jordan's first phone call. And we also know from Jordan's 911 calls that you can hear Eva in the background, which would indicate to me that she was close enough to him for the iPhone speaker to pick up what she was saying in the background. 
It's also interesting that she moved Olivia back to the bedroom. And we know that to be a fact, not only because she said it, but because Officer DeCrew and EMS say that the child was in the back bedroom. So the question becomes, why did she really move her to the back bedroom? Because if your child is injured and you're trying to get them help, you would think that you would want them as close to the door as possible if you're able to move them so that officers and first responders can get to that child as quickly as they possibly can. However, we also know that someone undressed Olivia, and we know that because by all accounts, Olivia was found in only a diaper in the master bedroom. The question then becomes, who undressed Olivia and why? Moving on. Uh, who's, who's the baby of, of Olivia? Jeff. Or the daddy of Olivia? Oh, see, I haven't even got a chance to call him. Have you talked to Jose lately? I talked to him yesterday. About what? I'm being sick. Have you texted him since yesterday? I tried to see him in Texas this morning. I got on Facebook and I see an old memory of us in the hospital with Olivia. I've seen pictures of her and him. That's, oh, okay. uh, that was just as soon as I opened my eyes, I checked my Facebook, smoking a cigarette. That was a. Uh, I woke up and I asked, I think I texted her and asked him where he was at. And right after I found that, I fell back to sleep. You fell back to sleep? Yes, sir. And then not too long after that, I think Jordan came in. No, 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 that was all, that was all whenever he left. Yeah, I got well, up. I say, when we get you, you yeah. so, so you were up the whole time. No, sir, I was not. From the time he left. I got up and I went to the restroom because my stomach was hurting. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And I was, I was on my phone asking where I was at, and uh, he said he'd be home in 30 minutes. Okay, I fell back asleep. And then that's the last thing I remember until he came in the door. And he woke me up standing beside me. This round of Eva's story is one of the most interesting versions of it. And it's also where she really lost control of her narrative. She gets confused on what she's said and not said and how she can make what she has accidentally said fit with the story that she's already spun and the narrative that she wants to continue. She starts off by telling Detective Perry that she had not talked to Jose and then she says, well, wait, I did text Jose this morning. She then tries to rationalize what she has just admitted to, which is being awake and using her phone. She says at first that she opened her eyes and checked her phone and saw Facebook and saw this picture on Facebook, so she texted it to Jose and then she sent a text to Jordan. And she claims that that text message to Jordan was inquiring about where he was. And then she says, no, 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 no. That all occurred when Jordan left. That makes absolutely zero fucking sense. From the moment Eva arrived at the police department, her story has been that Jordan woke her up in the morning and told her where he was going and what he was doing and that he would be back in a little bit. But now, since she's admitted to the text messages, which means she's awake, she has to somehow make that work with the story that she's already been presenting to the police, which leads to her saying that, no, 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 that all happened when Jordan woke me up. But it makes zero sense that Jordan woke you up and told you where he was going and what he was doing, and at that same time, you got up to use the bathroom and texted him, where are you at? From a common sense and rational thinking standpoint, that story's bullshit, and we all know it. But we also know from a factual standpoint, with proof and evidence, that it's a fucking lie because we have her cell phone records. We know for a fact from Eva's cell phone records that at 11.08 a.m. that morning, Eva sent a text message to her first child's father's ex, 
about how she had heard a rumor that somebody had allegedly slept with somebody else. She then continues using her cell phone and sending a variety of text messages to both Jose and Jordan. The best part about all of this is that we know for a fact from Eva's cell phone records that she started sending text messages on this phone around 11.08 a.m. and she stopped responding to text messages on this phone around 11.20 a.m. This means for a fact, without a doubt, Eva used this cell phone to send text messages over an hour after Jordan left the home that morning and over an hour before Jordan arrived back that afternoon. This is also the first time that Eva admits that she was awake and that she got up and out of the bed and that she allegedly went to use the bathroom. Now, moving on. That's what she done in herself. So wait a minute, you think he took her to the living room and killed her? I don't know. Is that because of the blood on the couch? No, I'm thinking the blood on the couch was from you taking her in there. That was me, and him both. Okay. Good and back. I understand that. Get her back, listen to me, get her but back. But I know what ha I done. Eva caught herself right there, let's hear it again. Good and back. I understand that. Get her back, listen to me, get her but back. But I know what ha I done. At four o'clock, or it, at dark, or whatever time it was, she got up, and I got up with her. She Don't kept telling me no. Y'all are making me feel like I'm back in the corner, like I've done something wrong to my baby, and I haven't done anything to uh, her. Hey, hey. All I want is for her to be okay, and it's not going to happen. No, it's not. And I don't know what to do. So what about what time did you text Jose about Olivia? Yesterday? No, until this morning. I don't know. I don't know what time it was. Y'all have my phone, I'm sure y'all know. I haven't looked at it. I don't know. I just seen pictures of him. It was, it was after, after you woke up. Random. So when you woke up, did you get on Facebook? That's exactly what I told you. Okay. So you got a, you got on Facebook. You got up about what time? I don't know what time it was. I just opened my eyes, smoked a cigarette, got on Facebook, saved the pictures, sent them to Jose, even sent them to Jordan and said, oh my God, look how small my baby was two years ago. Because the two people that were in the room when she died won't say. What are you saying? What have I always been saying since we've been here? You were there. He was there. So now and, and the dad was there. So now you know Jordan was there. How do I know he was there? He was there sometime during that time. And I understand that. You said something about her temperature earlier. Uh-huh. What was it? It was their what was her time of death. We don't know exactly yet. They're supposed to call us back and let us know. They're figuring that out. But it was sometime probably early morning. Really so early morning. Mm-hmm. Like, like four or five when I took you. Somewhere in there. Again here, Eva makes a very telling slip up. She says, So now you know Jordan was there? And she follows that question up with, what was her core body temp and what was her time of death? The slip up is saying, oh, so now you know Jordan was there? But then in my opinion, that's when the light bulb went off in her head. She realizes at that moment, in my opinion, that they have not specified a specific time of death. They've not nailed down any specifics. So she has based her story off of needing an accidental cause of death because she was the only one at the house to, oh, well, maybe I can blame Jordan. She was laying next to me and I was holding her or whatever and at first she was a little whiny. So I just I held her a little tighter. Mm -hmm. And no, 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 no. And so Olivia stopped it. And then and Jordan says, I need to go to the other room. 
I was like, what do you mean do you need to go to the other room? And he was like, because he was trying to go to sleep, whatever. She was talking. I was like, it's okay, you don't have to go to the other room, we will. Well then, she got quiet, so I put her back in her bed. In her bed or in the playpen? That's her bed. Okay, okay. And then I crawled back in bed with Jordan and went back to sleep. That's it. And by her saying no, she says it all the time. Because that's the word you say most yeah, of the Were you and Jordan holding each other and then went back to sleep? No. I, I started crying because I thought he was mad at me for getting Olivia up. And uh, he, I guess, he was holding me when I finally fell back to sleep. So what y'all talk about? Nothing, I was crying. Y'all didn't, they didn't ask you what's wrong? And I just told him, I don't even remember. I don't remember what I said, to be honest with you. Because I was just upset. I'm pregnant. My hormones are all crazy. Yeah. <sighs> there are a few noteworthy statements from this round of Eva's story. She says that Olivia was up and making noises and that she held her tighter and Olivia kept saying no, no, no. Now she says that Olivia had just learned the word no, so that was normal, but just in the context of which she stated that was a little weird. I held her tighter and she kept saying no, no, no. It almost sounds like a resistance. She says that Jordan was really trying to get back to sleep and so he asked if he should get up and go to the other room and she said no. Me and Olivia will go to the other room, but then she says that Olivia got quiet, so she put her back in the pack and play and went to sleep. The reason that I point that statement out specifically is because in a previous version of Eva's story, she mentions that she gave Olivia a bottle and then put her back to sleep. But in this version of the story, she does not mention giving Olivia a bottle and presumably she would have had to leave the bedroom and go to the kitchen to obtain a bottle and milk to then give that to Olivia. Eva also says that once she put Olivia back in the pack and play that she went right back to sleep but then she starts talking about no Jordan didn't hold me well actually he did hold me we weren't talking I thought he was upset but the only reason that she says she thought that Jordan was upset was because she got Olivia up, but she doesn't say that he said or did anything to even indicate that he was upset. She just assumed, for whatever reason, that he was, and she even mentions that she was crying, and the reason she gives for randomly crying at 4 o'clock in the morning is because she is allegedly hormonal. On that note, when I started recording today, I intended for it to be an additional bonus episode going over all of the different versions of the story that Eva told for November 8th, 2018. However, I see that I am swiftly approaching 40 minutes of showtime here, and there are still a ton of clips of Eva telling her version of events for that day left to discuss. So clearly this is going to be a multi-part episode. So I'm gonna wrap up this episode here and I will see you all on part two.